Jai Guru, everyone. Jai Guru. Jai Guru. Welcome to Yogananda Podcast, our next episode. We are finishing chapter nine today, this is part seven, quite a long chapter. It was about, or it is still about the Saint Master Mahashaya that Guruji reveres a lot. And I'm here with full crew today. So we're all here, Priyan, Chris, Lauren. How are you guys doing today? Okay. Thank you. Everyone's fine. See, Lauren is in her Christmas sweater already. She's getting, <laughs> <laughs> getting ready early. <laughs> yes. Can tell. So Chris is probably in some place where it's warm in Southern Europe. And... Yeah, Spain this time. Spain. Oh, yeah. I like uh, See, with Chris, he's in a different city each time we record. I like that. Mike's here. Yeah. I need to check out the SRF scene in Palma. I mean, Palma. Palma? Yes. Is that why you went there? To check out. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All in the yeah. Damn, damn. All right. You say no, that a lot, lot of, a lot of uh, Indian holidays are just purely geared around going to different ashrams and things like that in India. Oh. Like my aunts yeah. would literally just, that's their holiday. Not going to the beach, just different uh, temples along the way to the, the big temple that they're going to. That's how yeah. life should be lived. <laughs> yeah, I like it. Honestly, as I as I get older, I feel like this is what I want to do anyways. Like going to a... Because oftentimes those ashrams are in beautiful places, right? So mm. it's, like, it's actually not a, temples not a bad are, idea. Temples are mm. on the prime spot of a city or mm -hmm. yeah, they're well worth visiting. There's a beautiful yeah. cathedral here in Palma. I'm going to go check uh -huh. it out gorgeous it just nice. dominates the the skyline but obviously mm -hmm. it's not srf so mm -hmm. it's different but still beautiful yeah for some reason um this just reminded me of my trip to macedonia two years ago i went to lake ochrit and honestly the most beautiful spot in that lake where you have the perfect view that's where they built the big church and mm -hmm. like of course that's how it's done yeah <laughs> yeah people do pilgrimages there and then see the beautiful lake moving along in the chapter we um we are um, finishing it today and we are at this part um uh at gurji saying trying with poor words to do justice to his benignity i wonder if master mahashaya and others among the saints whose path crossed mine knew that um, years later, in a Western land, I would be writing about their lives as divine devotees. And I, I love that because he, I mean, he has, when, when he's writing that, he's already in America, but he um, has all of those interactions with those great masters and here with Master Mahashaya. And they're so beautiful, exemplary, and there's a lesson in all of them. And so maybe he thinks this is all working out so perfectly just because they want me to write this down later. Yeah, Priyank? Yeah, I think um, uh, Sri Yukteswar tells him later on, doesn't he? Like um, your, lives have, your life has been essentially guided for this purpose and you've met all these, essentially all these people along the way, all these greats, essentially to go and be this messenger of yoga to the West. So this is kind of like, uh, Pre presaged that this uh, little realization that he had. Yeah. And so um, he says he wouldn't be surprised if they would know, if they would like interact with him and say, like, oh, yeah, this Mukunda, he's going to write a book about me later on. So um, <laughs> every interaction with him needs to be exemplary. And, mm -hmm. and then he also says that the readers that have read this book so far with him would also not be surprised right and uh, are we surprised i mean <laughs> not, not at all right? it's, yeah. it's so so sweet isn't it it's such a sweet addition to that sentence that um guruji is exemplifying how humble he is and we've talked about it before where this is a not a biography of a yogi and often it is really just about other people you know he's not He's not obsessing about his own life and talking about the insights and revelations that he has. He's attributing a lot of the wisdom and learnings to everybody else. So 
it is just a no, very sweet addition to, to that sentence. Yeah. I also think that we, you know, we're the list, we're the readers of the autobiography, but I wonder if Guruji would have been surprised himself if he <laughs> knew that there'd be a podcast about and movie movies <laughs> about the, the book and then and then people will be listening on the audio to the podcast mm -hmm. about the book. <laughs> so there's like three or four, <laughs> three or four chains there. And heaven only knows what the listeners, how they're how they're uh, spreading the message as well. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I, I would be surprised if you do actually at Lauren. Uh, I was just to say I, I don't know if any of you had noticed Guruji's sort of little nod. Uh, you know, some people will have read the book and put it down. But he's acknowledging the readers that have actually come this far. Mm -hmm. So <laughs> even Guruji knows that people won't be receptive enough to even finish the book. Um, so yeah. That's a very really good point. I think we talked about this in the beginning a little bit, right? That he's easing us into miracles and things like that, right? It starts mm -hmm. out very, very normal. And then you get a, you meet a saint here and there, and then they do some miracles. And then, yeah. Right? I wonder if, um, like, people that were co, not co editing the book, Baramata and co, if they said to him, Guruji, it's a lovely book, but for, as for the general populace, it's very, very long. Uh, what, mm. would you have said, what would you have said? What would you have said, I wonder, to that? Oh, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I mean he was definitely someone pioneering a path that wasn't there before when he wrote this book. I mean, you have to also imagine when this book came out, it was 1945. It was a very, very different time. And then you, when you write about masters that you meet and they, they perform miracles, I can imagine the, there were a lot of people who, like Lauren said, would just put the book down after they read one of them. <laughs> it's like, okay, enough of that. Mm. It's quite a short book, though, isn't it? It's only like five hundred and forty pages. That's <laughs> Priyank's laughing, but that's not so long. <laughs> uh, well, it, I think it, that would be true if um, it was just uh, like mm. a simple novel or a simple explanation of one's life of you know events. And but yes. there's obviously colossal depth to every page, as we as we know, more than most now know. Yes, it did take me. I think probably well over a year to finish mm. the whole book so yeah say that but yeah. if, if you made an attempt to read the holy signs book with Swami Sri, uh. I find that that one was challenging in a different way to read because it was much shorter mm. and its content seemed to be much more dense but this one you just glide through so yeah it's 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 not short, but it's also not super long. Like imagine reading the Second Coming of Christ or something <laughs> like that. That's like a whole different challenge, I would say. Mm. Um, in terms of length, and I feel like the autobiography is a really really nice read. Uh, for me, as I mentioned it before, as German as uh, English as a second language, I struggled with all the um, the words that he was using in there that I had to look up because I feel like he's he's using a very a very nice English and using a lot of words that I hadn't heard before. Um you, you he, were he, you were following uh Yogananda's footsteps by carrying a Theosaurus. I think Yogananda <laughs> yeah. Theosaurus that need to to explain yeah. yeah I mean there's there's some people say that he was Shakespeare in the previous incarnation and mm -hmm. he he remembered all the good words from back then. So wasn't that that much but i i definitely noticed that it wasn't like simple english it was there were a lot of words i had to look up um he then he then continues um he he basically talks about saints in general um he talks about um the reconciling opposites but before that he talks about um god is the absolute and he calls it nirguna and inconceivable. And um, yep, Brian, you had a point about this. Yeah, nirguna is uh, essentially one one without qualities. I think he describes a bit later. But there's a very famous Kabir poem called uh, Nearby Nirgun, 
Gunre Gaunga. So essentially, he's um, he's saying, I'll sing about the glories of the one without any attributes. Um, and later on, uh, there's a very beautiful rendition of that song by um, by Pandit Kumar Gandharva. And at the end of this episode, hopefully I can play you some of that if we get time. I'm looking forward to that. Yeah, I would love that. And then he he continues. He he says there is this um, idea of the absolute, and then there is this idea of the universal mother. And then he says a combination of those two ideas is kind of an achievement um, of Hindu thought, and it is expounded in the Bhagavad Gita. And he gives a few examples. He says um, heart and head as two opposites that are being reconciled. He says bhakti and jnana, bhakti the being devotion, jnana being wisdom. Um, and um, the one is um, taking refuge in God, which is here in this context um, into the, um, I would say into the intellect, is it maybe the intellectual way? And then, and then um, flinging oneself with divine compassion or Let's say taking refuge in God is the, the father aspect and taking refuge in divine compassion is the mother aspect. So he, he brings those two things together a few times. And um, Priyank, you had a section in the Bhagavad Gita that, that was... Um, yeah, yeah. How, how I read this bit is uh, the personal theism yeah. element is mm -hmm. i.e. the personal, personal manifestation of God and the mm -hmm. absolute essentially being the... Uh, nirguna, the one without um, qualities mm -hmm. and without any form, essentially the absolute. And in the, you know, he mentions the Vedas and the Bhagavad Gita perfectly dovetailing those two essentially f forms of divinity that people like to take refuge in. And the, the verse is from chapter 12, verse 5. And the verse says, those whose goal is unmanifested increase the difficulties. Arduous is the path to the absolute for embodied beings. And he goes on to describe in the, in the description. The path of the worshipper of the unmanifested infinite is very difficult because the devotee has no support from the imaging power of his mind. Worship implies an object of veneration that holds the attention and inspires reverent devotion. A God, a God of manifested qualities. The formless unknown does not well serve this purpose for most mortal minds. He who is born in a world of forms can scarcely attain a true formless conception of spirit. Worship of the indescribable, therefore, automatically presupposes the actual experience of the infinite. Only those who are already spiritually advanced enough to intuit the formless Christ, as did Teresa of Avila, find joy in this relationship with the divine. That, that's super interesting, I find, because it kind of means that um, imagining God as a form is a real helper and a useful thing, especially while you are your mind is unable to worship the formless god right when once you can do that you probably don't need it anymore but until then imagining god as a person is a is a helpful tool in worship lauren do you want to carry on mm. the systematic yogi progresses through various stages of divine perception which coax and strengthen his efforts and devotion but the fruits of worship of the unmanifested are forthcoming only in the consummate union of the devotee's consciousness with God. Worshippers of the absolute must therefore be so intent on spirit that all their perceptions transcend inner and outer limitations and commingle as a singular intuitive realization of the infinite spirit. Such transcendent self-mastery requires from the very beginning the practice of stringent renunciation and relinquishment, relinquishment of all bodily attachment, total relinquishment. So this um, before in this in this in this section, he was talking about the head and the heart, right? And bhakti being one of the heart, and jnana 
being the one of wisdom. Um, so here, describing the arduous path um, of the one who goes for the wisdom approach <laughs> of the absolute form. Uh, there's some pitfalls, shall we say. Um, Mike, would you like to continue? I have a question. When when you, when it's written Chnana, do you actually pronounce it Kinyana with a G? Yeah. Oh, yeah, okay. Yeah. yeah. Ah, is that like, I think there's a similar word, a, a yakia, right? You also spell it with a J, yat, yachna, yeah. but it's a yakia. Yeah, no, right. yeah, okay. that's it, yeah. The, the middle yeah. bit, yeah, yeah. That, that, that like when you when you have your war cry to God or something. Yeah. yeah. Right. Chapa, chapa yakia, yeah. That's it. Okay. I'll continue. The yogi who worships a personal God, on the other hand, utilizes step-by-step -step methods of realization by which he progresses gradually and naturally towards his goal. The natural method for renunciation of lesser pleasures and attachments is to taste the superior joys of the spirit. The worshiper of a personal God finds all around him and within the inner temple of his consciousness constant reminders of the immanence of God, which fill his heart with divine love and joy. Without courting the hardships of a renunciant's life of rigorous um, asceticism, the yogi loves God so deeply that gradually all lesser desires leave him. It would seem, therefore, that God likes the personal relationship with the devotee, for he makes it easier for the seeker who sees the divine imminence in creation and concentrates on God as the heavenly father or cosmic mother or divine friend possessing human qualities. Or just as in slumber, the unseen formless human consciousness can shape itself into dream images. So the formless spirit as the creator, God, can inform his consciousness into any manifestation dear to the devotee's heart. If the devotee's ishta, object of worship, is Krishna or Christ, for example, the Lord will assume that concept. All such aspects are in no manner a limitation of God to that form, but are rather like windows opening to the infinite spirit. Beautiful. So Guruji makes this point about all, he says all great saints, and then he said they had some combination of those two, right? Of bhakti and, oh my God, saying that's so hard. It's Gnan. not Gnana, it's Gyan. Gnan, Gyan. Gnan, yeah. <laughs> Gnan. <laughs> so of basically devotion and um, and wisdom. And now he, he goes back to Master Mahashaya and, uh, through this, this sentence is very beautiful. He says, the humility of Master Mahashaya and all, of all other saints springs from a recognition of their total dependence, sesh, uh, seshatva, um, on the Lord as the sole life and judge. So it's, it's um, humility, but not because he feels humility um, because of other people that intimidate him or something like that, but it's it's pure humility for God that Master Mahashaya shows. And um, then he goes on that God is bliss. Another um, sentence that is very beautiful. He says, the first of the passions of the soul and the will is joy. So I think this gives you, I mean, he, he, he described Master Mahashaya a lot, right? He, he described him as someone who in this, I would say, if you put out wisdom and devotion, he's more on the devotion side on the on the, on this scale, and he's very close to divine mother. Um, uh, Further this here, I would say, yeah, Priyank. Mm, definitely, I really like this element of the aspect of total dependence. I mm -hmm. all the all masters have this um, humble total dependence on Lord, and this new this Sanskrit word seshatva. Mm -hmm. First time I've, I've I've read it. Uh, first time I've heard it soon may become one of my favorites because it's such a, it would be so great to have 
uh, that total dependence feeling. I, in Guruji here in the autobiography says that the Lord is then therefore the sole life and judge for for you, um, which is really quite beautiful. <laughs> Hopefully I can uh, live uh, live more in that space. Um, but the, the first of the passions of the soul and the will is joy. Reminds me of, um, firstly, the chant, um, ever new joy. Joy, joy, mm. joy, joy, ever new joy, joy. Um, and in in the Hindi version is uh, Ananda, Ananda, Nitya Navina, Ananda, which is similar to the Hindi version. Um, I think in, um, in one of the Kirtans once I did the English and then the Hindi as well. And you're allowed to play with it a little bit when during kirtans um but then also the um, uh, the aspect of such chitananda ever conscious ever new ever existing bliss consciousness in in joy essentially so it reminded me of that as well this um this sentence and i found a couple of uh, good little bits about that uh, seeking of joy in the bhagavad gita um chapter 10 verse 9 and it's uh, in a description he's written for that verse he's written such men alone no joy and the contentment of spirit that causes them to cry i am full o lord in thyself i have found all treasure what wonder then that the yogi urges the worldly man to forsake the momentary pleasure of the earth and to embrace the giver of everlasting bliss as a drunken man feels throughout his body the injurious thrill of alcohol so a god intoxicated devotee conscious of his augmented being in the vast cosmic body of nature feels an ever rejuvenating exaltation at the contact of the omnipresent joyful orm and uh, that uh, those two paragraphs really feel like a to me mm -hmm. beautiful and um there is a, a footnote after this sentence. He says, the first of the passions of the soul and the will is joy. And then comes a footnote. And I feel for readers of the autobiography of a yogi, we know those footnotes, there is always gold in there. <laughs> so we have to read them very carefully and see what we what's in there. And I, I find this footnote is a bit twofold. So he mentions, he mentions two famous uh, people in in history the, the the first is saint john of the cross who is a saint from the 1500s in spain who had a a life let's say there's some light and darkness not from him but that the things that happened to him i guess he was in a pretty dark time where he where he lived and the second one that a uh, person that he mentioned is sir francis uh, young husband and he's an um interesting guy um, it's interesting that Guruji mentions him here. And I feel like by mentioning him, he kind of shows the greatness of his life. And he has a section here where he describes the experience of cosmic joy. He was a, a, a British man who is, became famous for doing an excursion into Tibet. And he, and he wrote about it. And I'm just going to read it out. It says, there came upon me what was far more than elation or exhilaration. I was beside myself with an intensity of joy and with this indescribable and almost unbearable joy came a revelation of the essential goodness of the world. I was convinced past all refutation that man at heart were good, that the evil in them was the superficial. Amazing. Apriyank? Uh, yeah really amazing i i find that um it's curious that he's so he also describes it as an almost unbearable joy hmm. it, it's hmm. um it's curious because you maybe it's such bliss that um you know your body to contain your your soul in this body in such a state of bliss maybe it's pretty difficult you know but i'm just guessing here um, as to why it would be unbearable but uh, it's a curious curious word um and then I, I really love that concept at the end where that um that all evil is essentially superficial well there's such a positive positive outlook on on the world it's similar to what Diama said about, about evil where she said it's 
ignorance. She named it ignorance. I think there's a really nice quote from her. Very wise way to see evil, perceive evil. I, I feel like this, this perception comes also from your own state. If you have a state where you feel like really happy and full of joy, then it's easier to see the, the, the good in others. Whereas when you feel you're suffering, then it might be more difficult to see it and you might be expecting evil in others where there is none really. Um, I, I, yeah, I, I think um, to, sh to show that someone who, like him, I, I would like if Guruji wouldn't have added this footnote, I would not have expected that someone like him would have had an experience like this. So. I find I find that um, very interesting, and it shows that that spiritual people are like in the most unlikely places where you wouldn't expect them to be. Mm -hmm. um, and then, yeah, uh, let's talk a little bit about Saint John of the Cross. He, like like we said earlier, he was a, a Christian saint in the 1500s, and he wrote a very beautiful poem that I thought we could. Uh, read out. It's called the dark night of the soul, and that's also a term that is used um, in other ways, in also in the teachings. Right, the dark night of the soul is when you meditate and you and and then all you see is the the dark um, black nothingness. And this is um, not saying the idea. I think the idea is that this is not nothing. What you're actually seeing is something, right? And it's also a temporary thing. It's not something that should discourage you on the spiritual path. And I also use it, I believe, in the context of um, when you're going through real challenges spiritually, mm. when you're not feeling the love of God and you mm. wonder, wonder about your purpose. And then hence, um, in some of the SRF talks, they've called that the dark, dark night of the soul and that everyone goes through these moments. Mm. Lauren, do you, do you want to start reading? Mm. Yeah. In a dark night, with anxious love inflamed, oh, happy lot, forth unobserved I went, my house being now at rest. In darkness and in safety, by the secret ladder disguised, oh, happy lot, in darkness and concealment, my house now being at rest. In that happy night, in secret, seen of none, seeing not myself without other light or guide, save that which in my heart was burning. That light guided me more surely than the noonday sun to the place where he was waiting for me, whom I know well and where none appeared. Oh, guiding night, O oh, night, more lovely than the dawn, O oh, night that has united the lover with his beloved and changed her into her love. On my flowery bosom, kept whole from him alone, there he reposed and slept, and I cherished him, and the waving of the cedars fanned him. As his hair floated in the breeze, that from the turret blew, he struck me on the neck with his gentle hand, and all sensation left me. I continued in oblivion lost, my head was resting on my love, lost to all things and myself, and amid the lilies forgotten, threw all my cares away. Beautiful. I find it sometimes remarkable, you know, you, you read about saints that have lived hundreds of years ago, and they wrote beautiful poetry that is, and you read it now, and it sounds as beautiful probably as it would have back then, even though this must have been translated from Spanish into English, but it's still, so whoever translated it did a good job here. Um, yeah, and Guruji continues, and he continues to describe Master Mahashaya, and now 
he um, describes at, with what ease he communicated with Divine Mother and with God, that he he says he approached the Mother in a childlike spirit, but it's it is very natural that you just contact God or Divine Mother all the time and and work with them, play with them. And Master Mahashaya's life was like that as well. He he says that in God's eyes, there's nothing large or small. Um, were it not for his perfect nicety in construction and constructing the tiny atom, could the skies were the proud structures of Vega and Arcturus. Right? So there is no, because we often have this idea as devotees that we feel like, oh, this is just a small thing. I no need to pray for it or no need to um, talk to God about it in, in or after my meditations. But it's it's just something I, I will deal with this, right? And I feel like this is kind of um, saying the opposite, that the saints, they, put, they have divine mother and God in all of their thoughts. Okay. Mm. And um, he, he, he says like, uh, Master Masha's life, the manifestation of divine plays occurred on occasions important and unimportant. So mm. we know from the chapter that he would be in communion, ever be in communion with his divine mother, as Ramakrishna Paramahansa was as well, his his master. And it, I, I really like this play on words on on occasions important and unimportant. So then mm. it would it would appear that uh, nothing, n literally nothing, is too trivial to consult divine mother over and if you get into that habit of forever consulting god um and talking with him then then the that uh, that saying you know make him you know i am your own you are my own then that will become true isn't it and even guruji says doesn't he um for us to always talk inwardly to god and you know have our whispers so, uh, there's another reminder I also love this childlike spirit thing. Again, it's come up so many times, but I really love it because there's so much in that childlike description, isn't there? It's like children are so full of joy and so full of love and they're so open naturally to, to anything. And then from that sense of like play and wonder, it says here that they find Divine Mother ever at play with them as well. So it's like constant dialogue, isn't it? Um, between soul and spirit and something I feel like for us all to remember particularly me <laughs> you know it doesn't have to be so it has you know serious but not you know without joy <laughs> so yeah in the at the end of the paragraph here um is it referring to the connectivity of the universe and the connectivity of all the atoms so it says that surely you know the important and unimportant are surely unknown to to the lord for want of a pin the cosmos collapse so it's saying that everything is connected so everything has its purpose so there's nothing too small so one it's a really beautiful uh bit of wisdom like knowledge that really hits home when you read that doesn't it mm -hmm. well, yeah because if you think about it if something slight were to shift in the cosmos this earth may cease to be therefore we would not be on it and it's really mind boggling and amazing that everything is just in harmony it seems like it's in chaos but it's all in harmonious order isn't it uh, and um the other, the other thing is, um, for want of a pin, as Chris mentioned, is uh, used a few times. The pin is the humble pin or needle is used a few times in um, in in our teachings. One of them is um, where in the Mahabharat, um, when after the Bandus had done their twelve years in exile and um, returned for their kingdom, um, Duryodhan and the Kurus refused to give them back their kingdom. And and they said, um, I will not even give you the um, the amount of land that fits on the size or the end of a needle. That much land I won't give you. That's 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 the to the extent of their material uh, appetite. They wouldn't. Um, so I remember I remember that. That's a really good, uh, powerful story in the Mahabharata about the 
insatiability of uh, new materials desires um but the other one is also um around uh, guruji uses it a lot in this analogy in the bhagavad gita where he describes like imagining a pin under the influence of a magnet where it will point it will point north and forever point north and then obviously it relates that to um how we should be with our focus and minds always on the infinite yeah that's a beautiful um way to also end this chapter right because he he he, he mentions uh the i feel like the life of master mahashaya is um one of those one of those saints that like it's it's interesting he wrote a book about ramakrishna paramahansa right and then someone could have written a book about his life because it was I don't, i'm not going to say equally great but it was a great life of a saint right? <laughs> yeah and so well, and so he did in a way yeah. guruji did in a way i suppose yeah mm -hmm. he, yeah he dedicated a whole chapter to him in mm. in his in his book which is uh, i think one of the most read spiritual books out there so yeah 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 um um this was the written part of the chapter i would say um then one one thing um Priyant, you actually added a section about um there's a picture of divine mother um on in in this chapter as well which is very beautiful which is like she's she has four hands on it right and um the the aspect um there's like in 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 hindu philosophy there's always more than one aspect of divine mother right there's i think i don't i don't actually know how many they are i know guruji talks a lot principally from yeah. three from three aspects from three yeah three more okay. people so from the consorts of brahma vishnu and shiva there's three different ah, um, aspects interesting. yeah so we we saw in an earlier picture we we saw a picture of mother kali from the Kali temple in Dak Dakshinaswar. This one, this one is quite different here that, that you see, that, that you see here, um, seems less, um, uh, I don't know. It seems, it seems more of a, more of a peaceful, um, appearance here that we, that we see. And yeah. I believe, um, she's sitting on a Lotus. So usually mm. when, when, um, when divine mother is sitting on a lotus it's usually lakshmi lakshmi mm -hmm. and lakshmi is the consort of vishnu or krishna essentially so i believe that's the form of divine mother that's being represented it's a very beautiful form isn't it a really nice picture beautiful but then full but then of, she's but then but then she's got a this is quite a confusing one because then she's got a crescent mm -hmm. moon and then that mm -hmm. would imply it's, it's Shakti or Parvati, the uh, Shiva's consort. So it, 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 Shak, it says Shakti in the text there. Yeah. It's a, yeah. It's a bit of yeah. a. Yeah. Bit of a, yeah. And then um, the other picture we have in this chapter is a picture of, of Master Mahashaya, and it says the blissful devotee. And is this when you saw the picture, guys? Is this how you imagined him? Because I feel I feel like for me that's a yes, kind of that's kind of uh, the way he talked about him. He is he's this very peaceful, very very. He looks like a very friendly older gentleman. Frank. Now, I remember. I think at the start of this chapter, I said, um, you know, it's blissful deity in the cosmic romance and. We asked um, which one of the two is a blissful devotee, and um, mm -hmm. I said it's probably both. But here we seems we have the answer: the blissful devotee is Master Mahashaya, <laughs> as it's uh, in the quotes. Who who also said Master Mahashaya? You were you were <laughs> right. Whoever did. <laughs> <laughs> you have to go back. We have to <laughs> re, re watch the episode. <laughs> um, and then. Uh, Priyank, you have a you have a section about Master Mahashaya about the the last days of his life from the yeah. Gospel of Ramakrishna. 
Yeah, yeah. Yes, I can I can just read that. So about 27 years of his life he spent in this way in the heart of the city of Calcutta, radiating the master's thoughts and ideals to countless devotees who flocked to him and to the still larger number who read his Kathamrita, or the English translation of the Gospel of Sri Ram Krishna, the last part of which he had completed in June 1932 and given it to the press. And miraculously, as it were, he his end also came immediately after he had completed his life's mission. About three months earlier, he had come to stay at his home, at where the Holy Mother had herself installed the master. The Holy Mother here is um, uh, Sarada Devi, i.e. Ram Krishna's uh, um, wife, um, and where his regular worship was being conducted for the previous 40 years. The night of the 3rd June, being the Falaharini Kali Puja Day, M had sent his devotees, who had used to keep company with him, to attend the special worship at night. After attending the service at his home shrine, he went through the proof of the Katamrita for an hour, i.e. the book that we've been referencing through many of these episodes. Suddenly, he got a severe attack of neuralgic pain. Before 6 a.m., in the early hours of the 4th of June, 1932, he passed away, fully conscious and chanting. Guru Deva Ma Kole Tule Nao. Take me in your arms, O oh Master, O oh Mother. What a way to go. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, I feel like a lot of those saints, they don't waste any time, right? They do what they are here to do and then they go. <laughs> <laughs> you know, they, they have no time to waste. <laughs> Undeserved. Wouldn't you though, yeah. if you had the chance to go back? <laughs> yeah. yeah. This world would yeah. be gone in an yeah. instant, surely. <laughs> Absolutely. Mm. I, I, I'm not, I can't blame them. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> From their perspective, it makes total mm. sense. All right. Is it time to, to recap? on chapter nine guys what did you make of this chapter how does it compare to the others um well, right? for, for me it's uh, it's my favorite chapter thus far um mm -hmm. and it's uh, really yes. really one of the greats isn't it and um mm -hmm. my red highlighter of favorite quotes <laughs> there's four in here um, mm -hmm. And I'll go. Um, I'll go through them. When when Divine Mother came to Mukunda, she said. He said her face, tenderly smiling, was beauty itself. And he said always. And she said, always have I loved thee, ever shall mm -hmm. I love thee. So there was mm -hmm. that one. And then um, there there was those two or three discussions that he had with Mukunda. I um, think you that your devotion didn't touch the infinite mercy. The motherhood of God, which you have worshipped in forms both human and divine, could never fail to answer your forsaken cry. That was the second one. And the third one was, since we are both devotees of the mother, you may put the garland on this bodily temple as an offering to her who dwells within. And then the last one, I think, is really beautiful. I started, this is Makunda speaking, I started to kneel in gratitude on the ground before him. You can't do that to me now, he said. You know that, you know God is in your temple also. I won't let Divine Mother touch my feet through your hands. Gee. Really nice. So this chapter was really beautiful for me. I found lots of great appreciation also for Ram Krishna Paramahansa and all the ways that he's got a dotted line to our own um, lineage. Yeah, it's a very playful chapter, isn't it? You know, begun in such a playful manner, very, you know, quick pace. And we were all laughing about how Guruji, as young Bakinda, was very pushy and sort of, you know, um, Master Mahasha was making making the plea to Divine Mother on his behalf. So um, even though he had his answer himself from Divine Mother, it appeared to him, he still went and sort of, uh, talk to Master Mahasha, like, you know, well, do you have an answer for me? Do you have an answer? You know, he was rather impatient and 
Um, it's just a, a lovely moment that we have this um, insight to. But then the second thing really for me was the the um, recognition of Guruji uh, and his, let's say, ascension into into uh, this state of uh, as an avatar. You know, we're coming to see that he is established in in uh, divinity and. Um, he's getting the recognition by Master Mahasha here. So, yeah, lovely sort of coming of age in the sense of uh, for Makunda. And there were there were moments like I feel like Guruji is building up to to something here, and uh, there are some new some new highs in this chapter. I would say there is definitely that section where he knocks him on the chest, and suddenly um, he goes into a state of ecstasy, and then. I, uh, what was the what was the word bioscope? I was like, oh, you like that bioscope? <laughs> 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 um, and and uh, the the there's this one aspect here that I liked a lot. The uh, this this um connection that Master Mahasha had with Divine Mother and with the the Mother aspect of God and Mukunda has that as well. So he he doesn't talk about this that much. Um, but he. But whenever you see him pray for something, he always reaches out to Divine Mother. And so it's something the two have in common. And of course, this earlier part of the book is about Guruji looking for his, uh, or Mukunda looking for his guru. And then they have this chat where he says, yeah, I'm not your guru, but your guru will come soon. So he he knows, he knows everything. So I like, that. those are my favorite parts. Mm. I was listening to a talk on the by in SRF about um, is by Sister Karuna, and it was one of the How to Live series, which is entitled mm. "How You Can Talk with God." And she referenced this chapter where she was um, discussing like the boy Mukunda, how he would, um, you know, he clutched he clutched his feet, Master Mahashai, and he shamelessly gripping his feet, he deaf to his gentle remonstrances, he besought him again and again. So essentially, he was. He was, um, as a child would, he wasn't letting go of the feet of Master until he um, acquiesced and said, uh, yeah, he'll make his plea to the beloved. And she's saying, this is how we should we should also be childlike, you know, and be de be as demanding, essentially, as Mukunda is, <laughs> was there, because they're lessons for us. Another thing that is shown in this chapter is the the connection between Yogananda, the Kali Temple in Dakshinasvar, Ramakrishna Paramahansa, and how Master Mahashaya ties all those three things together. Right? He's kind of he he's the biographer of of Ramakrishna Paramahansa, and he goes with Guruji to the Kali Temple, right? So and then and then he, yeah. So so th those are those are all things. Now, if you are a, a a devotee of Yogananda, you revere um, this Kali temple as well, right? Because your guru was there and he was there because um, um, he went there with Master Mahashaya and so on. It's a beautiful link, link, linking those stories together. Yeah. And then, um, yeah, we could say this is, I, Priyank said this was his favorite chapter so far. Because we got a we got a big one coming next. We got the one where he meets his guru, chapter ten. Um, and I think there's a lot of people who would say that's the favorite chapter in the book for them, right? There's there, there's a lot of things happening. Um, Guruji first. I don't want to spoil the chapter, but let's say Guruji being a bit discouraged. And then suddenly it all clicks and it all makes sense and all falls into place. I, I would, this is how I would, yeah, explain this chapter. Yeah. Um, yeah, the next chapter is one of my favorite chapters and it's got one of the most um, emotional, uh, touching scenes, isn't it? With when he meets his uh, guru, <laughs> gets me uh, quite emotional just reading that when I do. Um, uh, but it's exceptionally long chapter, <laughs> and I've uh, tried to split it up. It's going to be nine, nine or so um, episodes. So it's uh, 
going to be quite a project. Um, but we are very much, uh, very much looking forward to it. Um, but uh, we can perhaps end, Mike, with um, a bit more about that poem, Neo Gunnar, that I was talking about. Yes. Yeah. Exactly. So um, I'll put a link to uh, the whole of the the, the poem, um, but essentially talking, and this is Kabir who writes this poem, and then it's sung by this this pundit. Who I'll also put a link for Pandit uh, Gandharva, who's a very famous singer, which we'll sing, which I'll just play you a little clip off before we end. Um, so, but the the bit that he's going to sing um, is that. Uh, essentially using the base lotus as the steady seat he says or sings i will make the wind rise in reverse i go up the energy fly up through the chakras to the uh, thousand petaled lotus and then he the chorus comes again to that uh, nearby nirgun which is to that one who is attributeless without attributes and fearlessly i will sing and continue to sing so that's what uh, you're about to hear what it means, but uh, just enjoy. It's a very powerful voice he has. So see you all next time, everyone. Jay Guru, we'll end it there. Jay Guru. <laughs>